Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming. Welcome to Baldur's Gate 3. I've been very lucky to play the full release slightly early thanks to Larian Studios. And so with that, I've actually been playing the game a lot, learning a lot, and I have some important beginner information I want to share. These are details that should help you be a lot less overwhelmed as you jump in yourself for the first time, like I was. As new players, there is a lot to consider and learn, to try and so on. And I want this video to be a way to give you the tools to approach the game without needing a lot of the trial and error, leading to the basic understanding that I have. I also want to do that in a relatively spoiler-free way, avoiding any important reveals. So here is my starter guide to Baldur's Gate 3. We'll begin with the meat of the guide, which is combat. Now, in and out of combat will function completely differently. So when I'm out of combat, I can move freely and do whatever I want. For example, jump that would normally cost, say, a action, a bonus action, I can just kind of do because I'm not in combat. So I can move around freely and I can leap around freely just as long as I don't leap off something high and take hit point damage as you can see. So out of combat you can freely move, use actions, interact with the world in many ways. The other things you're really limited by are things that will take rest or spell slots really that need recovering. But this means you can move around and do most of what you want in the open world without consequence. But now when you're in combat things are limited a lot more by the 20 points of movement shown at the bottom right by that wheel. Now your choices actually have consequences to consider. Above your abilities and options you'll see these icons such as action, bonus action, lay on hands in this case, channel oath charge in this case, and spell slots in this case. Everyone gets an action, everyone gets a bonus action, and then depending on your class, you'll get some other interesting details and potentially spells. By hovering over abilities, you can see what it will require in combat. For example, my main hand attack will cost one action, but that will leave me with a bonus action because it's not consumed. You can click these to reveal everything you can do that would consume a bonus action. For example, now that I've attacked with my sword, I can still maybe shove the enemy, sending them flying off a ledge, hopefully. But many classes also have another thing called cantrips, which is essentially a spell that doesn't use a spell slot and can be cast as many times as you want, but it will cost an action. So if you're ever in a fight where you don't think you're going to get to rest for a while, or you want to conserve your spells that are more limited and tied to resting, well, then you can use cantrips. Something you'll see as I swap between my characters is that they all have the same common actions on the left here, such as jump, hide, throw, dash, disengage, help, improvise melee weapons, shove, and dip. Common actions can be used in many ways and are often incredible options, especially when they consume a bonus action rather than a full action. In the middle of combat, you could move your max distance, right? And then jump to go even further or vice versa. You could shove someone off a ledge dealing great damage and putting them in a bad position. And that's not even used your action. So you can still attack after that. But arguably the most effective and most important one, especially when it comes to how you engage in combat, is going to be hide, leading to stealth. When you hide, it actually reveals perception or lines of sight as red on the ground. These red areas basically show where enemies or even currently not enemies can see. There's an icon when you're doing this that shows like a full sun, half sun or empty sun. Full sun being most exposed, half sun being less exposed and empty sun being much more hidden. But stealth always leads to surprise. If you're able to begin an encounter by surprising enemies by attacking them from stealth say, this essentially causes the entire enemy group that you're dealing with to be stunned, to be surprised, meaning they lose their entire first round attack, which can settle a fight before it even begins. This is why rogues generally are ridiculously strong in Baldur's Gate. Aside from that though, we also have other important mechanics to the passive of all combat, such as high or low ground. Let's say you get to a high ground area on top of a roof or something else, and you're attacking downwards onto an enemy below, probably using ranged attacks. High ground is essentially a buff that increases both your accuracy and your damage. It quite literally adds a plus two bonus to an attack roll, so 100% of the time you want to be using high ground if you can in the middle of a fight. This means that repositioning mid combat or before combat to prepare for a fight is really good. If you're dealing with enemies that have high ground on you, you absolutely want to change that, at least get level with them as soon as possible. When you have the low ground, you're going to have less accuracy and of course they're much more of a threat to you. Outside of manually moving yourself to these high ground locations, especially when dealing with high ground enemies, it's actually a really good idea to use teleports like the Misty Step. That as a spell is incredible and can put you onto high ground instantly. There are other ways to move around such as flying, seen commonly with summons. One of the early spells you can find allows you to summon a sort of magic hand. The magic hand can actually shove people or throw things at them. So you could spawn it behind someone on high ground and shove them off their perch, which could be an incredible way to deal with that situation. Now a major detail to dealing with scenarios where you're learning and you're a new player is right clicking 
on everything and examining it. It'll bring up this window and tell you what they're weak to and what they're not weak to. For example, this goblin sadly has no resistances, so they're not weak to anything, but they're also not resistant to anything. As another example, let's say this trunk here was locked and I had no way to open it. Well, I could examine it and see what its resistances are. As you can see, in this case, bludgeoning would be doubled damage against this trunk, and I could use a blunt weapon to smash it really effectively and get to whatever's locked inside. But you can do more than just inspect other things. You can learn a lot about the world by inspecting, say, items. When hovering over something, you can just press T on a keyboard. That brings up the menu. What is Adrenaline Rush? Well, it's a passive, as it turns out, that grants me wrath for two turns after I dash. But what's wrath? Oh, it's a buff that gives me plus one bonus damage with melee weapons. So Adrenaline Rush gives me plus one melee weapon damage for two turns after I dash. This is a great way to learn about pretty much everything in the game. Being able to control your party in combat and out of combat is really important. For example, on the left here, there's a couple buttons. Firstly, we have group mode, which you can click or press G. When you press this, you can see how the icons sort of separate to show that they're no longer grouped. This means instead of everyone moving together, I individually control my character. So I'll send my paladin over there. I'll send my mage over there. I'll send my fighter to move over here. And the rogue can just stand here in the middle for some reason. As soon as I press G or group them back together, they'll all group on the person that I'm currently highlighting, such as my rogue. So that's how I can quickly regroup. Why this matters though, is of course tied to many details, such as stealth. My rogue is obviously going to be better at stealth than everyone else. So separating the rogue off to send them off on missions just to clear an area or check things out is obviously worth your time. Especially if the character you're actually clearing and checking with has high perception, because that means they'll be able to spot secrets like traps and expose and avoid them. There are many areas in this game where it's better to check things out rather than run blindly in as a group. So separating your team off and having a scout or scouts go ahead to check things out can be a really good play. But also manually controlling a group before a fight can be completely clutch for the scenario. Positioning your casters and rangers on high ground before a fight starts, stealthing your rogue into an ideal backstab position, getting your tank up front and center prepared to basically block the way to the squishy rangers. There are so many ways you can organize a group in and out of combat and knowing that you can individually control them is obviously really helpful. Also, if you just want to stealth for an area, there is a button that's literally toggle hide or shift C, so you can just stealth with everyone whenever you want. Next, let's talk about the camp and resting in general. This button at the bottom right here, the camp and resting menu, is going to be a very good friend of yours. It has three options. Go to the camp, short rest, and long rest. You can go to the camp pretty much whenever you want. And just like that, it'll bring you to a suitable camp associated with the area you're in. And here you can find your allies just hanging out. Here we can actually progress relationships and important storylines with those allies. It's important to actually come back to the camp semi-regularly just for that, just in case there's a new event or conversation you can have with an ally. But also the camp will massively help with storage. For example, we have a traveler's chest in each camp. And as you can see, I've got a bunch of junk and different stuff in there that I'm planning on selling. It's a lot better to have that junk in this chest than having it all in my inventory and weighing me down. The really cool thing is you don't have to actually come back to this chest to put stuff in it. What you can do is open your inventory anytime and take this great axe that's wasting to space and is heavy for no reason. You can right click it and just choose send to camp. And then when you're here in the camp and go to the chest, it will literally be there just like that. Though you can also come to the camp and open the chest and drag things in manually if you're there. It's also quite a lot faster than like individually clicking, but there are many ways to do that. This is an important feature to know because you should be looting pretty much everything you see. Unlooted containers basically have this chest icon with a star over it to show that you've not looked in there. It's always worth looking, assuming it's not red and you're stealing. In any container, you're more than likely to find some sort of useful item, usually food tied to resting, we'll explain in a moment. But there's loads of stuff you can find. Useful items, trinkets, coins and silver to sell. And you might even find useful equipment that you'll want to equip or even scrolls that you use in mid-combat. It's so unbelievably worth it to loot and take most everything and then just send it to the camp so it's not even taking up any inventory room anyway. Then you can find a trader at any point and just sell all your junk. This is a great way to make money, which leads to having gold to spend on various things that will matter, especially when it comes to buying useful equipment in the early days. But what about the other two things to do with the camp like short and long resting. So for example, let's look at hamstring shot here. This requires a short rest after you use it. And it's telling me that I've currently I've currently consumed it and I need to do a short rest before I'm allowed to use this ability again. There is a bunch of abilities that will have a short rest requirement. Short rests can be used twice a day. Basically every long rest they get reset, but before then you can tap them and it will restore 50% of your entire party's health and also those short rest required 
actions. Meanwhile, long rest requires a bit more than that, but is well worth doing. When you use this, it'll ask if you want to end the day and then you can say yes or no. As you can see, when you do this, important story events will occur. So it's also really important for you to come back here to progress these story elements, but let's skip this for you. So when you do a long rest, it will also bring you to the campsite in a similar way, but at a certain point you can go to bed using the actual campfire in the middle of the actual campsite. Here it'll give you the option. You're going to need 40 camp supplies total to actually rest and get a full heal and the full restore of your spell slots. As you can see, you can use random junk items and of course food that you find in the world and that consumes these supplies. Or there are supply packs which you can buy and find which will be a 40 out of 40 use. The best thing to do is just auto select. It'll use the cheapest, least valuable stuff pretty much automatically. Then you can press full rest and get everything back. Now another aspect to camp is the fact that you can go and speak to your allies and they each have their own tent and information here. By speaking to them you can always select the option wait for me in the camp basically having them leave your party because you can only have four in your party at once and you're going to find a lot more allies than just four for example you're going to need a party composition that works for you the generic and standard guide info that i can give you for having a good party comp is always to have a balanced team a standard concept of ideally having someone that takes the damage, so a tank, someone that can heal and buff like a healer or utility support, and then some sort of mix of ranged and self options. That could be a rogue and a spellcaster, or you could consider a ranger. It's just that that concept is likely the safest and smoothest way to organize a party. Of course, you can pick whoever you like most and run whatever the hell you want. But if you're playing on, say, tactician mode, the hardest mode, you're going to want to have a group that is strong as possible and can deal with the most scenarios as possible. So once you've actually unlocked a few of the NPCs and can actually pick a party, try to create a party that can handle a variety of situations. At very least, I would always suggest you have someone that can handle stealth and has good perception to reveal traps, find secrets, and scout areas for you which is going to be a major part of the open world experience. One little bonus tip I want to shove into the video is a shovel. This kind of unassuming item is actually really important. And as long as you have one, you can dig up mounds that are revealed via perception. When you're just exploring the world, these mounds might randomly appear. As long as you have a shovel in your inventory of one of your characters, you can then dig up whatever's in that mound. Basically it exposes a chest and you might find some really useful items, or in this case, a hundred gold. Missing out on this just because you didn't have a shovel in your inventory kind of sucks. You can find them pretty much everywhere or buy them for very cheap. Lastly, a quick word on respecking, which is indeed a thing in this game. As you can see, I'm speaking to an NPC that I'm hiding from you for spoilers, and the third option is, can you help me change my class for 100 gold? This is respecking. This is done with the character Withers in the camp, once you've unlocked him and brought him basically to the camp. In the first area and region that you land, you will land and begin the game about here at the bottom right or southeast point of the map. And as you work your way up along the beach, you will encounter a locked door and an NPC. This is the over grown ruins and quite literally behind that door is a ruin. Inside of this ruin you will find a room that must be opened by pressing a button which then spawns enemies, these skeletal enemies you have to defeat and inside that room you'll open a coffin and that will reveal Withers who after a conversation will then eventually show up in your camp which then means you can speak with him for various things including respecking for the original 100 gold. But there you have it, that is my starter guide, a bunch of different information and tips to do with combat, outside of combat, useful stuff that I've kind of through experience learned myself and hopefully now that I've shared that stuff with you today, you can avoid having to waste your time and can have a lot more smooth of an experience. If you guys have any other starter tips that might help along this line, then drop it in the comments. You might help someone. But for now, I've been Hollow. You've been you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is, uh, goodbye.